Uh, I think the easiest way to introduce a speaker of some eminence is to spring the cliché of how the speaker requires no introduction at all. Right? I will refrain from taking this easier path, not because Professor Niladri Bhattacharya requires one, but because I think contributions of Professor Bhattacharya and people like him to scholarship deserves constant reiteration, especially in a context where academic merit is being increasingly measured internationally, only in terms of the kilograms of published paper one can turn out each year. Professor Bhattacharya joined Jawaharlal Nehru University as a student in the early 1970s and retired from the same university last year as a professor of modern history after a glorious teaching career of more than four decades. Beyond a few years, he spent at St. Anthony's <laughs> College, Oxford, as the Agatha Harrison Fellow, and a few visiting professorships later on he held in Paris, Johannesburg, and other places. He largely spent his academic life at the Center for Historical Studies in JNU. His contributions are not simply to be understood merely in terms of what today we call institution building, you know, but in actually training a generation of historians who are now scattered all over in some of the top universities across the world. And uh, I can assure you they have many Scopus indexed journal <laughs> publications. Uh, Professor Bhattacharya's research and publications comprise a wide range of issues, including questions of agrarian history, processes of colonial codifications and lawmaking, politics of history writing, and so on. He has been the editor of Studies in History, one of the most important history journals to come out from India. He has edited many, many volumes of academic essays. He also has a deep interest in pedagogy. He acted as the chief advisor to the revised NCRT history textbooks that were published in 2005, and continues to have considerable interest in how students are taught history in different contexts across India. To his students, however, Professor Bhattacharya remains a master practitioner of the oral tradition. His class lectures, be it on historical methods, colonial power, or capitalism, were attended by students and faculty, not only from the Center for Historical Studies, but from many disciplines across JNU and beyond. Towards the end of his formal teaching career, attempts were made to finally record some of his class lectures, which today circulates through informal networks among his former students, but I hope that Professor Bhattacharya will soon allow us to make them more publicly available. Uh, today he is going to talk to us about customs, traditions, customary law in colonial Punjab, issues that has interested him all through his research career. The material I understand is derived from his latest monograph, titled The Great Agrarian Conquest, The Colonial Reshaping of a Rural World. This is the only book I know of, the title of which was widely known to the public at least a decade before it actually came out. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure, therefore, to welcome Professor Niladri Bhattacharya to Jaindal University. Professor Bhattacharya. Thank you, Vishan, for that introduction. Um, I choose to speak on is custom tradition, uh, reflections on the history of customary law in colonial India, partly because it is uh, part of the interest that I have in understanding custom and law and the way it is, uh, the way they are framed and codified in colonial period, uh, but also because the question of custom and tradition uh, resonate with the politics of the present. Uh, in what way uh, custom is tradition? As I say in, in the abstract, uh, it begs the question, what is tradition itself? Uh, and uh, therefore, I uh, uh, return from the present, which throws up questions of custom and tradition, to the politics of codification in order to make a set of more general points. Through a specific study of the colonial codification in Punjab, I will uh, talk of what codification really means, what tradition means, what custom means, and the variety of ways in which they become part of a codified, accepted uh, law, which is seen as customary law. <clears throat> um, in talking about 
codification of custom. I'll focus primarily on Punjab and Haryana and parts of uh, West UP and all, but um, most of the evidence comes from there. But I'll contrast the process of codification in Punjab, uh, Haryana, that I'm referring to, with uh, what went on in Bengal, uh, in order to make the point that colonial rule um, operated in different ways in different places. It did not have the same impact. It did not govern in the same way. Uh, the politics of governance itself was varied and different. And that difference is something which we need to understand and look at. Uh, it was in um, 1776 that the first major colonial digest uh, on Hindu law was published. That is the Code of Gentu Laws. Um, by uh, translated and edited by Halhead. Um, about 100 years later, uh, in 1881, appeared Tupper's Customary Laws of Punjab. This is the three volumes that he collated and uh, edited and uh, uh, commented on, uh, which was based on the, uh, the, uh, the, codi the exploration of the codification process uh, in the different districts of Punjab. And from that, he goes on to make a larger argument about what Punjab customary law is and the way it will and it needs to be codified. He formulated for the first time in Punjab uh, a, a framework of questionnaire on the basis of which subsequent volumes of customary law will be produced. Uh, and to uh, refer to that process of codification, um, one uh, needs to remember that this is not just one or two volumes being produced. Every district produced almost two volumes uh, over the colonial period. And there were about 30, 40, 50 volumes produced over time. And so an enormous corpus of literature which was produced, which tried to uh, uh, observe, record, uh, observe, codify, and record uh, what the customs and practices of the people were in Punjab in different regions. Now, in the late 19th, 18th century in Bengal, it was uh, the Orientalist tradition, as most of you know, it was the Orientalist uh, tradition which was dominant at that time. Uh, and the, the translations and collation of documents and ancient texts uh, were done by Orientalists, like you know, John, Jones, William Jones, to later Colebrook, to Halhead, many others who are uh, actually inquiring into custom, inquiring into ancient laws, philosophy, and translating them, because they believed that uh, it is the ancient tradition which expresses in the most condensed and pure form the culture, tradition, and laws of India. And in order to uh, actually create the basis of a modern society in the colonial period, we have to return to the purity of those customs, uh, 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 look at them, translate them, and make them available for uh, wider circulation. It is on those bases that we can actually um, uh, govern the local people. We cannot implement Western laws over India. In fact, uh, before studies on law uh, really began in the 1970s and 80s in India, uh, um, in our generation, most of the historians, if you look at, they all tended to very uh, uh, cursorily say that uh, colonial period, uh, in the colonial period, we have the imposition of Western laws in India. Like it was said that in the colonial period, it is Western education which was imposed in India. Both are simplifications. It's not such a simple process. Just like there is a whole politics of vernacular education and the support for vernacular education at different levels which happens. And uh, English education and Western scientific, so-called scientific education, is limited to a particular level within the hierarchy of education. Similarly, uh, about laws, one can argue that uh, there that kind of uh, imposition of Western Anglican law did not take place. There is a difference between, uh, and this is very important, there is a difference between criminal law and civil law. Criminal law was homogenized, and it was uh, from Macaulay's uh, um, uh, code uh, to the subsequent codification. There is a homogenization of criminal law and introduction of Western uh, legal ideas within the criminal law, but the civil law was one where there was an effort to actually understand local practices. And uh, uh, in many regions, in, in the East, it was uh, Hindu and Islamic practices. In the West, 
uh, as I'll argue, it was community practices which become important for them to study. Um, in the uh, eastern region, in uh, Bengal, um, Shastras and Qurans, uh, the, the Quran and the Shastras uh, were believed to set out a code of conduct for the Hindus and Muslims, and they defined the basis of customary law for the Orientalists, and they defined the relationship between co within the community and between communities. So the original authoritative text had to be discovered, they had to be studied, they had to be translated, and then codes were to be framed on the basis of those Shastric and Quranic traditions as Islamic law and Hindu law. Uh, this Orientalist thinking about custom, that custom has, uh, that law has to be based on custom, on tradition, on the past, and therefore an inquiry into the past is necessary. Now this was uh, very powerfully and uh, very assertively and aggressively criticized in the early 19, mid, uh, in the 1930s and 40s uh, by the Bentham, Benthamite <coughs> uh, utilitarians in India. Um, they criticize the obscurantist reverence for custom. That tradition was obscurantist, it is uh, necessarily backward, and a modern society cannot be built on an obscurantist reverence for tradition. Uh, the task of law, according to the utilitarians, was to define the basis of a new social order. In a certain sense, this is the modernist vision of a new social order, rather than conserve the old regime. It is the traditionalists who are arguing for the old regime and the new uh, order that uh, uh, colonial officials, colonial uh, state needed to build had to be based on modernity and the ideas of liberalism and utilitarianism become critical to the formulation of that vision of the modern that utilitarians represented. Um, so the valid, valid uh, concern of the lawmaker was not the discovery of past custom. It was not the law as it is, and that's the uh, law as it is, but rather the law as it ought to be. So for the Orientalist, it is law as it is, but for the, uh, for the Benthamites and the liberals, it is what ought to be. And therefore, notions of Western notions of liberty, uh, equality, justice, uh, uh, rationality, reason, all these should become part of that assessment of existing law, and transformation will have to be, uh, have to be structured and shaped by, uh, through the mediation of reason and utility, uh, rather than uh, based on shared tradition and customs of the past. Now, the Punjab tradition, uh, Punjab is conquered in, uh, in the late 19, uh, 1840s, uh, and by the 50s, um, the new legal, new inquiry into customary law begins. Now, the Punjab tradition reacted against this Benthamite utilitarian idea. Um, now, some of these uh, uh, arguments are there in one of the papers, which I can see is part of your reading list here, which is remaking of custom. I'm just summarizing a little bit of that because I will be talking uh, about the, the judicial process, actually, through which customary code is reinvented, re reworked. Uh, now, this Punjab tradition, it was uh, reacted against uh, this uh, utilitarianism uh, and uh, the reference to the immemorial tradition, the reference to the past as being the basis uh, sorry, the, uh, they argued for an uh, uh, customary code which will be, which will in encode and codify uh, the past traditions and customs rather than uh, in uh, rework that uh, in, uh, in terms of the vision of what ought to be. So what is is more important than what ought to be. Uh, drawing on uh, English common law traditions, uh, they assumed that custom was based on practice and practices are what we need to uh, look at. So this Punjab Laws Act, uh, which is uh, in, uh, enacted in 1872, um, uh, 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 stated very clearly that the, the sacred laws of the Hindus and Muslims were to be followed only to the extent they exist in practice. And they are not to be accepted if practice differed from them. Therefore, the object of inquiry was to see the distance and difference between sacred laws of the Hindus and Muslims which may be there and the practice as it was on the ground. 
Therefore, what exists in the ground, what people believed and practiced and uh, actually acted according to, that is something which ought to be uh, codified. Uh, so what we find here, uh, uh, as I mentioned in the essay that is uh, part of your reading list, is that there is a contrast between the, not only the, uh, the, the Benthamite or, uh, utilitarians, but the early Orientalists of the late 18th century, who, who, as Latamani and many others have tried to argue, uh, actually celebrated the textual tradition of the Hindus and Islam. And in fact, Latamani goes on to argue that the problem with the codification of custom is that uh, it was based on text. But actually, if you look at it, uh, look at the evidence, apart from the East, in most other places from north to south to Maharashtra, it is the practice which becomes more important. Therefore, we need to understand why, how practice becomes the basis of a new legal system, a new legal regime, which is the codification of custom that is taking place. So um, it is um, uh, uh, against that tradition of the late 18th century Orientalism, the uh, uh, focus not on text but on practice against their uh, uh, attempt to uh, uh, encode Hindu and Muslim law. This was community laws and on the ground and the variety of laws there which are practi uh, practiced by people, that had to be encoded. And this is done uh, through a process. It begins immediately after codification and goes on till the early uh, 20th century. But how was custom to be really defined and discovered? And that's a critical question. And again, there's something I've uh, written about much earlier uh, and is only a background to what I'm discussing uh, now. Uh, when you talk of discovery or um, actually understanding the custom as they are on the ground, then we are really talking about uh, a, a, a process of discovery which implies uh, that in order to, dis uh, which implies that uh, uh, a set of things. That is, in order to discover, you need to see, you need to observe, and you need to look. But what is observation? What is this act of looking and gazing? How do you look and gaze? What is it structured by? For all our observation, when we observe anything in the world, even now, when we observe, we observe through a frame of reference. Our structure of reference, our conceptual apparatus, our assumptions and uh, uh, structure of ideas, they shape what we see and what we cannot see. The questions we ask and the questions we fail to ask with the questions we cannot even imagine because they are out of our frame. They don't exist within our frame. If they don't exist within our frame, we cannot ask a question. And this is true of not only observation in this sense, but in a more general sense. Historians in the 1950s and 60s and 70s asked a set of questions we don't ask now. But they couldn't imagine the kind of questions historians now are asking because it was out of that frame. They operated within a framework, for instance, of nationalist Marxist frame, which threw up a set of questions, which they probed and explored and wrote excellent books within that frame. But what it was limited by was the fact that it was structured by a frame which, they are, which we now uh, transcend and critique and go beyond in order to pose other questions. And future generations will critique these generations in order to pose new questions. But I can't imagine what those questions will always be. I know that in my own history of 40 years uh, of uh, academic history, I've changed my position so many times. I've critiqued earlier ideas. I've engaged with this earlier. This monograph that Ishan was referring to is an engagement, is a new engagement with the kind of arguments and ideas I put forward in the 1970s and 80s, which was my early work on agrarian history, to talk about a completely different frame of looking at the agrarian, conceptualizing the agrarian. How does one even begin to look at it? And these are not questions that could have been posed earlier, just like I cannot pose the questions which next generation uh, can pose, because the shift in focus and frames and assumptions and argument matters a lot in, in the way we look, inquire, and explore. Therefore, inquiry and exploration and observation, and observation are not innocent and problematic acts. And if we look at the history of codification, we can see how these, uh, these observations were structured, what are the kinds of questions posed, and how those questions actually framed the, the, uh, the, the arguments and answers which, were, which the informants then gave. Because the, if you don't ask the informant a certain set of questions, they can't give the answer. 
you, these were directed uh, inquiries which probed and pushed the, uh, the informers to s answer a set of things which were of concern to the British officials. And they usually were questions to do with property. Who owned the property? How was it to be transferred? Who inherited it? How were transactions to be understood? Those were questions for the agrarian order. You need to understand how property transition takes place because you assume that the order of agrarian society is premised on property relation. And therefore, the set of questions which are asked are all to do with property. And understanding which proceeds and follows are a follow from that. There are a whole uh, set of other questions which may be asked, which they never ask. And therefore, they don't know the customary law for those things. And we don't have evidence for those because they were not even asked in the inquiry. So inquiries, therefore, as I am um, uh, saying, are uh, uh, inquiries, explorations, are things which we need to historically query. We need to understand how the inquiry proceeded, what was inquired into, what was the frame of reference, and what was the answer, what was the kind of the answer that they got, and how that answer then was codified and structured into a set of. Because after you get the answer also, you sift the evidence. You accept some as critical and others as ancillary, some as important, others as subsidiary, some as anomalous, others are, uh, uh, as uh, uh, critical and core. Therefore, what you see and what you foreground becomes an act through which custom is transformed. Custom is uh, uh, you know, produced and refigured in different ways. Now, um, this uh, is something I don't wish to go too much into, but just to state that, uh, uh, that, the, uh, that uh, the customs, first of all, I'll just make three uh, short points here. First of all, customs, when they were inquired into, just in the early 1950s, that inquiry had to be based on a set of questions. That had to be based, those questions have to be based on a certain understanding of what the customs of the people could be. Therefore, even before the inquiry takes place, manuals were, had to be written up. And those manuals, like Temple wrote a manual on, uh, now that had to, that, those were based on, had to be based on some evidence. And where did that evidence come from? That evidence was based on the Orientalist textual production of the East. Manhattan, uh, um, Halhead, uh, Colebrook, Williams, they provided the evidence, their text provided the evidence on which seemingly an opposite, pra opposite uh, project was undertaken. That is, the customary law inquiries were shaped by the Orientalist vision of uh, the, the Orientalists in the late 18th century. Therefore, there is an intermeshing of the two projects at a, even before the project takes off. It's only subsequently there is a critique of many of those assumptions, but uh, they couldn't ever get away from many of those assumptions, many of the Orient, early Orientalist assumptions, and their inscription on the project as they unfold in the uh, uh, Punjab uh, Haryana region. Um, <clears throat> Second, who were the informants? That is critical. Who provided the evidence? If men provide the evidence, very often the rights of women cannot be recognized because it is the male voice which talks about women's <coughs> rights. If the senior elders provide the evidence, as we find in Africa, for instance, um, then the rights of the juniors there, the juniors, are not uh, often recognized. The hierarchy is re-established between the seniors and juniors here, between the elders of the village and the, and the uh, community as a whole. If the powerful elite or um, uh, high-class, high-caste people give the evidence, then the rights of the Dalits will not be recognized. So what we find that uh, the process of inquiry was such, and this is not a process which has changed even now. Uh, you can see the resonance of this process in the politics of all political parties today. That is, um, uh, Bengal, in Bengal we find the Orientalists uh, got their information not only from ancient texts, 
they were the pundits and the, and the Islamic uh, uh, authority, you know, those who uh, uh, were, authori uh, were authorities in Islamic law and philosophy, they provided the evidence. It, so the Beng Bengal pundits become a source of the information about uh, Bengal custom and the ritual textual tradition. Uh, their knowledge was both accepted and denied in the sense that you couldn't do without that. The British officials couldn't do without their information, but they were seen as suspect, always uh, manipulating, changing. They were corrupt people, as they imagined the Indians were always corrupt. Therefore, pundits were producing uh, laws uh, uh, in the way that they wanted. So therefore, the, uh, the, uh, the officials wanted to overrule their idea in order to encode what they thought was proper there. But the information very often came from the pundits and uh, um, Islamic uh, uh, knowledge holders. Uh, uh, in Punjab, the village elders become the sources of knowledge. And the village elders are the patriarchal head of the village communities who wield power within the village. Now, within this kind of imagination, inevitably, the power of the village community, the hierarchy within the village community will be reasserted. And I, as I'll argue uh, later, that it is patriarchal power of the brotherhood uh, which then forms also the panchayats and others, which is reaffirmed through the codification of custom and a whole range of other uh, uh, changes that take place, which displaces the rights of women, Dalits, and those who are outside the village community, including the moneylenders and all, uh, because of which there is a long history of struggle between the moneylending Banya communities in uh, Punjab and the agrarian community, politically expressed in um, Arya Samaj uh, on the one hand and the Unionist Party on the other, the battling between the Jats and others being expressed in the Unionist Party. Muslims, Hindus come together to oppose uh, the Hindu, uh, 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 Hindu Baniya communities who very often support the, um, support the Congress. And the, so there's a battle which goes on here. But the rights of the Dalits, one would argue, the rights of the Dalits and as well as the uh, women are displaced from the moment that elders uh, were, had, were inevitably to be displaced from the moment elders became uh, the sources of custom. <clears throat> so uh, what I'm arguing is that the, uh, the uh, inquiries were framed through questions that the British uh, um, uh, British post, and therefore those questions frame, uh, frame the nature of the answers they got. And they were uh, uh, also framed by the way that uh, they interacted and had a dialogue with the village elders uh, who were the informants about custom. But the actual inquiry process is even more interesting because when the elders uh, how did they codify custom and know about custom? They would go to a village, gather all the village elders to a region, gather the village elders from different villages in one place. Then they will fire off questions about various things, which were, again, primarily to do about property. Now, uh, in that process of a dialogue, there is an interaction, an encounter uh, uh, taking place, which is a process of acceptance and repression. You accept some answer, repress others. You uh, legitimate some things, foreground some things, and you are suspicious of other things. You make the distinction between what is uh, actually the tradition and what is a deformation. And this process of encounter, if we probe that, we find that in that act, custom and tradition is again being reinvented. Just to give an example, some, uh, 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 what uh, we find that in, uh, for instance, in Banu, or in the northwestern frontier, and many other places, the, the official actually uh, asks a question uh, uh, about uh, Shara law, whether the women can inherit, etc. And uh, mm, the elders, the chiefs there, say, yes, they can inherit. But Thorbun is not happy with the answer, and he pushes them to uh, uh, ask for evidence, etc., and ultimately persuades them to believe that actually women cannot inherit. Why I'm uh, making this point is that all my evidence subsequently will be about women's inheritance and widows' inheritance. And therefore, this kind of an act of a dialogue, which goes, uh, which is the product, uh, which is actually a process through which displacement takes place, uh, is reflected at various uh, levels in very many different ways. At the level of the inquiry, at the level of um, um, uh, framing of questions, at the level of choice of the informants, and all these things come together to make 
for a process of codification which produces uh, rights uh, about customs uh, in ways, uh, uh, rights within the customary code in ways which is not really uh, what they set out to do. That is, uh, encode what exists in practice. Because what exists in practice, when encoded, is reworked, reframed, and rethought. And therefore, this is the process which one needs to uh, look at. And I argue in uh, one of the uh, chapters of the book and a paper on remaking custom I published that this is a process of uh, fixing of an attempt to fix the custom. Codification is an uh, attempt to uh, fix the custom which will do away with the ambivalences of opinion. And that is a Benthamite idea. That is uh, English common law, uh, the critique of English common law was that it is all ambivalent, it is all fluid, everyone changes opinion. And if it is based on such opinion, how can we have a firm basis of law? To have a firm foundation of law, we need to be categorical. We need to publicly state what is a law. We need to encode, codify, and fix. And this Benthamite project was part of the project of codification. Although they critiqued the Benthamite project, uh, at one level, they internalize uh, the Benthamite project of codification, fixation, uh, uh, etc., and assume that the foundation of law had to be unambiguous stated rule and norm. Now, this uh, is a picture which suggests that the state was powerful. The state was actually encoding, transforming, governing everything, and changing. Uh, and uh, towards the end of that uh, article and the chapter, I uh, raised the question uh, whether the state was really so powerful. And today I'll go on to argue uh, that how uh, the state could not reach beyond a point. And their reach uh, lower down at the villages and uh, their reach was one which uh, allowed other prax practices to operate. Uh, uh, beneath these codes that uh, were formulated, uh, there was the evidence of unmodified past practices which conflicted with the codes. So what existed on the ground very often did not conform to the rules as they were uh, codified and enumerated in the codes that were formulated. Uh, the inheritance ru rules, uh, the rights of women, the norms of marriage, all these did not change with codification. While the codes stated one, uh, had one particular vision, projected a particular frame, which I'll discuss, at another level, something else was happening. And we need to see this dialectic or this uh, uh, confrontation between what is happening at the lower ground and what is codified as a norm and practice at another. And uh, I, I would argue that this questioning of uh, the code at the level of practice, this flouting of norms within, also reacts back, also has an impact on the code itself. Over time, the, the codes are transformed. Uh, judges uh, actually mediating between, in the case of conflict, when different kind of evidence comes, uh, come up, they often critique the code, reinterpret the code, and over time, judicial intervention refigures the code. And therefore, what happens in the history post-codification is a history which is slightly different from the way the codification process, and that shows uh, how powerful is the practice on the ground. That is, the state doesn't have the power to govern, change, and transform everything. It does so, and there's a pressure to do it, as I'll argue, in the longer term. But within the shorter term, many other things are happening. And these battles on the, in the farm, in the, in the court, and the practices as they uh, unfold in the villages are important for us to understand. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, with these, uh, um, this argument uh, about the, how the codes emerge, really, I'll move on to discuss uh, s three or four case studies uh, of three or four different kinds of rights um, from amongst a whole range of rights that I've worked upon, just to uh, show an, uh, how these, uh, uh, how uh, actually there are different layers of uh, um, confrontation and conflict uh, within the within the village society and in the uh, in the courtroom and the legal space, which tell us about a history which we need to know. Uh, so, so the the general the more general argument uh, about 
how code or custom or tradition is reworked is something which, is, uh, which requires us to see how they actually come to be, uh, how they are in the process of making in the history, in history, uh, in the way they unfold and develop in the villages and in the courts over time. I'll, from uh, <clears throat> uh, a whole range of uh, uh, rights, I pick up only two to discuss in a little bit of detail to make the points that I'm making. One is the, what, I, uh, what we refer to as patrilineal inheritance. And um, I'll talk of it as the myth of patrilineal inheritance. And the second is one where I'll talk about um, uh, what I uh, subtitle as the rights of uh, chastity. Um, what happens if a woman is seen as unchaste? What happens when a widow is seen as unchaste? What kind of rights do they have? Um, there are other rights which I'll relate to this about adoption, about uh, um, wills, about uh, gift and various others in order to make the point that all through, if we look at this, all of these are related to property rights. If we look at, uh, at all this, we see how codification of custom at one level is not such a simple process. It's extremely complicated and full of tension and conflict on the ground. But at another level, over a period of time, there's a pressure uh, from officials and local power holders, uh, pressure in a direction which actually consolidates the village brotherhoods, uh, the Kap panchayats of the West UP and other panchayats of this, and the brotherhoods who then define what norm and custom is. And they, they become uh, the basis and authority and wisdom of custom, uh, uh, um, uh, wisdom of the village, and their voice counts, and therefore the rights of women, Dalits, and others inevitably are displaced in that process. Uh, <clears throat> colonial officials assumed, um, and this is to talk about the myth of patrilineal inheritance. Um, uh, patrilineal inheritance, um, very simply uh, put, is obviously, uh, you will know it, but before I discuss, I think uh, I'll state in just a, sec a sentence that is, patrilineal inheritance implies that, uh, male patrilineal inheritance <coughs> implies uh, uh, that the property devolves from, in the male line, from uh, an original holder of rights to the next male uh, in a male lineal line. It doesn't, uh, it, there is no inheritance of women, that is the daughters don't inherit, and the daughters, uh, you know, uh, if uh, the fa uh, that is, uh, 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 the property holder's brother's daughter cannot inherit, or property holder's uh, sister's uh, uh, the son cannot inherit, etc., because that is in the female line. So patrilineal inheritance essentially means that property devolves in the male line over time. Now, if it, it does, why does it? How does it? Is it tradition? How has it come to be? And uh, when did it become tradition? That, those are issues that we uh, need to look at. And that's the point I'll try and make towards the end also. If something is referred to as tradition, when did it come up? Are we referring to immemorial custom in the midst of time that we are referring to? Or is there a history of that tradition? And if there is a history, what is the politics of the tradition? And what does it reflect over time? That w when the changes come about, a consolidation of our tradition happens, what is, the, what is that tradition? These are some general points I'll try and make towards the end. Um, the Punjab uh, uh, the, uh, officials assume that uh, Punjab agrarian society was uh, based on tribal foundation. Whereas Bengal uh, society was based on caste, Punjab society is based on tribal foundation, and the defining elements of the order uh, uh, was unlike the East where it was caste, here it was the ties of blood. Mm, the idea was that originally they were all tribal settlements, uh, uh, and the original founder of the village was the original, uh, per the person who cleared the village, and the rights devolved from him. And over generations, the, the lineal inheritors, male lineal inheritors, uh, and the link with the, that particular founder of the village is what defined your claim to the brotherhood. And all the members of the brotherhood were linearly, were, in, were agnetically linked. They were uh, in some way brothers uh, in some generation. They, they were all descendants of the same founder. And therefore, they were 
connected together. So property holders were, that's how it came to be. It was not how it was earlier in the colonial period. They are therefore seen as agnetically connected, kin, they are kinship, they are connected as kin uh, through kin and blood and become a brotherhood. Um, uh, unilineal uh, male agnetic descent was seen as the ordering principle of Punjab agrarian society. And women could not inherit, and therefore uh, sister, the sister could not inherit, the daughter could not inherit, sister's son could not inherit. Uh, that was how it was codified initially. Um, this patrilineal principle was uh, sanctified in the customary law uh, that was initially codified uh, in the first uh, civil code of 1864 as well as the Punjab Laws Act of 1872. Uh, so in terms of these codes, sons, not daughters, inherited property. And in the absence of sons, property was to pass to the nearest male agnet in preference of all female uh, uh, descendants. The son-in-law had no right to inherit the uh, father-in-law's property. Uh, and, and a widow had a life interest on the property that is till she lived. After that property, the land uh, reverted back to the uh, husband's family. Her share in hus husband's back inevitably, therefore, was connected, uh, was limited. Uh, that is, it was a life interest in land, as it was called. Uh, within this, uh, w uh, uh, in the colonial imagination, this was a necessary, this uh, patrilineal uh, uh, frame was necessary for a rural society based on agnetic uh, linkage because if women begins, begin to inherit, then an outsider will, be, uh, will enter the community because women move out. If the son-in-law has a right from another village to the property in this village, then the compact the, 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 uh, the, uh, the male contract, the brotherhood of this village will be threatened because an outsider has a claim over this. You could not, if you move out, then you lose your right. And the women moved out. It was an exogamous marriage system where women moved out and uh, not a patrilocal. You don't, didn't stay in the father's place. And inevitably, therefore, the daughter lost the right, the uh, uh, son-in-law lost the right. So this is inevitably something uh, which was seen as uh, necessary to consolidate the village brotherhood rather than uh, subvert the premises and the foundation of village brotherhood. That is the, the, the uh, subsequent um, uh, power of the brotherhood came from this kind of a control over land. Uh, officials were aware that the act, in actual fact practices were diverse. It was not so easy to say that women had no rights. And as the cases, and I've gone through thousands of cases of property uh, in the, from the 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, through the early 20th century, and they are extremely interesting reading because you find contrary arguments being given. Uh, and there's a diversity of opinion and a battle for, uh, for an, um, a battle in which Different people are arguing different things where practice on the ground questions the assumptions of official code and the official assumptions question the practice on the ground. And this battle were resolved in different ways in different judgments. Over, over time, there is a, we can see the trend. But in shorter term, over 30, 40 years, there's a history of confrontation battles and conflict through which codification happens and through which tradition is being defined. A particular patrilineal, patriarchal system is coming into being. Uh, so it's an uh, ironic fact that uh, colonial, uh, colonial state, which sought to represent modernity, and uh, uh, were attacking uh, sati as this uh, um, custom of the, uh, the, the colonial uh, male, uh, um, uh, patriarchal male system, uh, uh, were actually consolidating an extremely patriarchal structure in other parts of India. Um, let me uh, look at just a few cases uh, to uh, talk about. Um, what the system was. Now this is case number one. Now, I just refer to only one case and discuss one case because I'll run out of time. Uh, Kishan Singh lived in a village in Amritsar. This is 1850s. Um, his daughter, Archa Devi, and son-in-law, Mehtab Singh, 
the son in law is Mehta. Uh, the names are important because there is a convoluted argument around it. Uh, lived with him and looked after his land. Kishan Singh dies in 1853. His widow, Rup Kaur, took possession of the property, but her daughter in law, daughter and son in law, continued to reside with her, looking after her, managing the land, and bringing up their own child, that is Jodh Singh, in that, on that land. So sh they live with the mother and look after the mother as well as the land. Therefore, there is the, the, uh, the uh, Mehtab Singh is, in uh, uh, Punjab terms, is a Khana Damad or uh, Ghar Jamai, as it was called in other places, that you come and stay here. Therefore, you are not, uh, the woman doesn't move out of the place. The, the husband comes. And the, uh, the reference to that is uh, uh, Khana Damad in the sense that you have uh, become, uh, your Khana and other things come from here in a certain sense. Now, uh, after Kishan Singh dies, uh, this is the initial change that takes place. That is, uh, uh, Rup Kaur, uh, uh, who uh, as a widow takes possession of the property, but uh, the son-in-law and the daughter continue to live. Now, after Rup Kaur um, uh, uh, dies in the early 1870s, uh, Archa Devi and Mehtab Singh continue to live in the place and cultivate the soil, looking after that property. But in 1875, Kishan Singh's, that is the original owner's nephews, file a suit challenging the daughter's right to inherit. Now, the question was before the court, uh, first lower court, then the higher courts, as it, did Archa Devi and her son, Jod Singh, have right to Kishan Singh's land? Because according to the norm and according to the assumptions of the court, this is not permissible according to patrilineal court. Um, so uh, Justice Lindsay, um, no, sorry, uh, at the, um, sorry, um, uh, on, on the basis of the inquiries, first, the assistant commissioner uh, gives the judgment. And uh, he argues, after looking through a lot of evidence, that the daughter could not, there was no custom that the daughter could be, uh, 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 could be excluded from the rights of the land in favor, uh, and that the right should not go to the male uh, agnets. Uh, the commissioner, when this case goes up to the commissioner, he reverts. And uh, he argues that Gunda Singh and Bhag um, Bhagwan Singh, the two uh, uh, heads, the village wisdom, the uh, elders, their opinion are taken. They ruled against the daughter. Inevitably, very often, uh, uh, male opinion goes against the daughter and the family. In all these things, what you find is the family battling against the village elders. The family, in some way, creating a space of fluidity within which things are impersonally decided, whereas the norm and the code is uh, not permitting that to happen. So commissioner refuses it. Then Archa Devi appeals to the higher court. And this is very important, that in all these cases, what is very clear, that the women are fighting. It is not just that the men are fighting. In some cases, it's very clear that the male, uh, the man is the, uh, the person who actually fights on behalf of the woman. There are lots of cases which is very clear. The woman fights alone. And they're going to the court. It's, these are courts which are set up uh, in, uh, in the late 19th century. And it's not a new thing. It is not an old thing. And they get used to the system of courts. They realize, and Punjab, Haryana, possibly more than any other place, and uh, West UP, that everything goes to the court uh, very easily. And uh, courts become a site where rights are defined and redefined, questioned, and subverted, as well as asserted. So when Archa Devi appeals, uh, the case goes up to the chief court, whether the judges again express very, very, very different views. Um, uh, Lindsay uh, actually uh, talk, uh, deriving himself uh, um, from the, um, um, uh, uh, deriving uh, his arguments from the evidence that is on the ground, he uh, says the Gunda Singh and Bhagwan Singh's uh, evidence were his personal opinion. The practice actually shows that the women can inherit this is uh, the the Gharjamai, uh, the um, the son-in-law and the daughter has a right to uh, the property, and you cannot displace them. But Campbell, the second judge at the court, uh, says uh, uh, on the contrary that the agnetic principle cannot be subverted. That is the foundation of ours. Uh, and in all this, that's an argument which comes up, that you cannot so easily subvert the agnetic principle. Not that it is not subverted. Very, very, very frequently it's subverted some other. But the idea that if you subvert it, the entire agrarian order will collapse. 
It is the order based on male compact, male brotherhood, male structures. You subvert their power, British rule in the, colon uh, in the rural areas cannot be sustained. They are uh, the basis of a uh, British rule. Uh, so uh, he argues that the validity of uh, the agnetic principle cannot uh, be uh, subverted. Uh, so as a consequence, the debate goes on. And ultimately, um, uh, uh, the rights are, uh, in some sense, uh, denied. Uh, and uh, uh, the theory of male agnetic descent is re-established. There is a displacement of uh, uh, the right. Now, I argue that in many of these cases, um, uh, in many of these cases, uh, we see these opposing arguments, agnetic principle versus uh, being pitched forward. But by the late 19th century, uh, 70s, 80s, you see many cases where the woman is actually winning the case. Uh, and this is a case not only on, on Petrilina, this comes up in, in the case of gifts as well as wills and adoption. Did a sonless proprietor have a right to adopt? That's a critical question of property. Adoption is an extremely loaded uh, issue. Now, sonless proprietors very often did not want the property to go on to a distant agnate, because all male, male agnates had a um, uh, right in the eighth uh, line, that is um, not just the, the next uh, of kin, but uh, somebody could come uh, 20 years later and claim a right that I am somehow related to it and it will go to court. So adoption meant a denial of the right of the male agnet because you are adopting a male from outside the village and asking him to come and become part of the village. He takes care of you. You are sunless. There is nobody to take care of you. He takes care of you, looks after you, looks after the property, and you adopt him, and therefore he becomes uh, uh, assimilated to the brotherhood. This was the norm, very frequently the norm, in most places in Punjab. But the category was never used. Adoption as a category was never used. It's a colonial invention. What was done was, in practice, people came and lived, and it was there. And the pressure on land was not as acute as it is in the late 19th century. Land prices are not high. Production is not expanding. Agrarian fronters are still open. And there is no pressure immediately to fight over small pieces of land. And the practice, as it was, that adopt, uh, these uh, the, uh, males could come and live and become. Now, this becomes a, a regular practice in the 18 and 90s, because patrilineal inheritance uh, becoming the norm means that rights may be denied uh, to, your, uh, uh, to the daughter or the sister, son, etc. Therefore, it is better that they are adopted. If they are adopted, it is as if through adoption you sanctify that. And most cases of adoption, a lot of cases of adoption, are permitted in the 70s and 80s, but by the 90s, and the early 20th century we find that adoption cases are being criticized. They are seen as a manipulation of the code and a subversion, basis of the subversion of the agnetic principle. And it would lead to the disruption of so agrarian order. S exactly the same thing happens with gifts. Now, the British are very keen on knowing whether gifts are uh, part of the uh, practice in the countryside. Now, gifts very often were also given. Um, and the land was gifted very often when you had no son. Therefore, you gift the land to the nearest male relative, or to the daughter's husband, or to your sister's son, someone uh, around you. And you gift that in a, without using the, necessarily the term gift, so that in some way you are looked after in your old age, the land is looked after, and uh, things continue. But this again, uh, in the 80s and 90s, we find, although this is opposed to the agnetic principle, because actually you're giving it to the uh, uh, non-male uh, uh, agnets, uh, it was permitted because it was happening on the ground. By the 90s again, and the early 20th century, the male opinion is rules against this. As the land prices go up and others, they say, no, this cannot be permitted. Women don't have a right. They, you cannot. Uh, 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 gift or uh, adopt a uh, male from the women, uh, fem female line or give a gift to a man who, doesn't, who is not an agnate. You can gift it to an agnate, but not to somebody else. So this goes on. 
And there are many other forms of rights which are uh, extremely important, but they all demonstrate this move towards patriarchal uh, structure. And I'll uh, discuss a little about um, uh, the question of chastity and wind up uh, to, by making a few comments. For, take 10 minutes. I'll take. Um, now, within uh, codified custom as it was in Punjab, uh, widows and daughters, uh, mm, the rights of widows and daughters to the extent they, it, they had was uh, made dependent on the purity of their bodies. Um, the courts proclaimed that according to custom, an unchaste widow lost her rights to her husband's property. In everyday life, however, as I'll try and argue, that actually uh, the meaning of chastity was uh, less clear and its implication was much more uncertain than the courts initially recognized. And this ambiguity was reflected in judicial practice, where judges did not really know how to rule in favor of uh, different people's claims. Mm, this is uh, case number two that I refer to. In 1868, all mid 19th century, uh, till, and the cases very often go on for 20 years. Uh, these are uh, shorter cases over 20 years. There are some cases which go on for 30 years, they're battling. Um, in 1868, Mamraj, a zamindar of a village in Delhi division, files a suit for the possession of a piece of land that he had bought from Musammad Sundar. Now, these names are again important <coughs> Mamraj and uh, Musammad Sundar. Mamraj complained that Bhola, along with a few other peasants, refused to let him occupy his land. But who was this Mamraj and who was Bhola? Um, what was their relationship with Musammad Sundar? What rights did they have to Sundar's uh, property? Um, Musammad Sundar's husband, Suklal, uh, died in 1853. Now, Bhola was distantly related to Suklal and then cultivated the land when, which Sundur inherited as a widow because she had a prop, uh, life uh, claim on the land. Uh, what was their exact relationship? The evidence doesn't tell us, but we know that Bhola raised money to get Sundur's daughter, Nutia, married in 1857. And it was uh, taken for granted in village society that if you are investing money on somebody's daughter's marriage, that actually you have a claim to the the returns from the land which are there, and there is some sort of a relationship between you and others, whatever that nature of the relationship, which was not gone into. Uh, now, this uh, is uh, 1857, and that Nutia is married. Now, some years later, Sundur begins to live with another man. Now, that was uh, uh, earlier that uh, Bhola is involved, uh, and he marries uh, the daughter. Now, she, he begins, she begins to live with a man called Mamraj, and he bears, uh, she bears uh, him a child, and subsequently, around 66, sold her land to him for rupees 100. This was very clearly to prevent it uh, uh, being uh, taken over by some male agnate. You know, you give the, sell the land uh, while uh, you are alive. Um, Bhola was now, that is the earlier person, who had actually got the daughter married, Bhola now was unwilling to give up the occupancy of this plot, which he had, because he had looked after the land, got the daughter married. He refuses to give over the land to this uh, new person, Mamraj, uh, who has a relationship with Sundur. Um, uh, was Sundur's sale uh, to Mamraj valid? Did she, in fact, have a right over the land that she had sold? Now, these are issues to be decided. How do you decide and discuss this? And this leads to a long uh, debate that uh, takes place. And uh, the argument is um, that uh, the, uh, differences of opinion take place. And in this debate, what is very clear, that the, the, the chastity of the woman's body comes under question. That is being debated in the court. Now, if you are unchaste, you cannot, um, uh, have, you do not have a right to the property. Um, but if uh, you have inherited, what is finally decided is that uh, actually Sundur could sell that land to that person because Sundur had inherited that land. If she was unchaste, she could not inherit it. But having inherited it, 
she had a right to give it over because unchastity came and her not being chaste came much later on. Therefore, her uh, 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 sex uh, sexuality is being debated, her unchastity is publicly affirmed, but her right to the land is also affirmed. Therefore, it is not as if agnetic principle always displays the rights of women. Even in such a complicated case as this, Sundu's right is, um, uh, is affirmed by the court. And these, uh, and you have a number of cases. In the book, I have discussed many cases like this, where you find in cases of uh, uh, chastity and widow's rights, various others, uh, um, uh, very clearly, the question of chastity was, in Punjab particularly was uh, linked up with very clearly over the um, control over property. It was not a moral question. Women within uh, the Punjab uh, framework, women were allowed to have, uh, widows were allowed to have a relationship with other males within the, within the family. But you could not have a relationship outside the family. The way it's not a moral relationship about people having a relationship with another male, it's a question of property going over to somebody else outside the village brotherhood. And this is something which could not be uh, permitted. Um, uh, so it is again to do with the consolidation of village brotherhood and the property holding of the land. I'll give just one more case uh, uh, on the same uh, theme before I wind up. This is Kharak Singh a Jat peasant of Gurdaspur Tehsil. Um, he leaves, this is a very interesting case, uh, he leaves uh, the village uh, with no intention to return. Before he leaves, he tells his wife, Chandi, uh, that she could marry any man she liked. Some years later, Chandi goes and begins to live with her husband's cousin, Ishar Singh, which is actually permitted within the uh, structure because uh, within the family, within the agnates, you are allowed. It doesn't threaten the property right. This is allowed till very recently. And even now, this is a practice in large parts of Punjab and other regions on the Jat belt, uh, even in West UP, which is not seen as something problematic. Eight years later, uh, so, uh, so eight years later, Kharak Singh returns to the village. He continues to live uh, in the village without making any move to reassert his conjugal rights over the bill. So she continues to live with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the husband's uh, uh, cousin, which is Ishar Singh, and he is staying in the same village. But when Ishar Singh dies, that is the husband's cousin whom she was staying, living with, when she, he dies, now Kharak Singh attempts to claim his property. He argues that uh, he argues that he, that is Karak Singh, who was the earlier the husband, had had uh, not actually left his wife, and the rela relationship with Ishar Singh was therefore both invalid and immoral, and that Karak Singh was in fact the real father of the child which had been born. Now you can see here it's a, such a uh, in complicated case where Karak Singh uh, actually is claiming Ishar Singh's right because he has, she, he has a connection with the, the wife. And yet saying that this is, uh, uh, he has never left the, uh, the wife. Then how can he claim the property of uh, Ishar Singh at all? Uh, so this uh, goes on uh, uh, where uh, the, the right of Ishar Singh and others are being uh, debated and Karak Singh. Now, what right could, the, could Karak Singh have over Rishi Singh's property? To assert the right, Chandi's relationship with Rishi Singh was both accepted and denied. Chandi was the only link with Ishar Singh, which as I mentioned, and actually Karak Singh could continue to be the husband. If he was continues to be the husband, Chandi could have no independent right, and the morality of her relationship with Ishar Singh would deprive her of any possible claim to the property, a double displacement. But was Chandi's action legally immoral? Did she have no right over Isha Singh's property? And ultimately, after a prolonged debate at different levels, it goes up to the chief court again. The, the ultimate judgment is that Sundur was not immoral. She had a right to the property. And she, uh, 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 that what actually happened is that when uh, Karak Singh leaves the village, his leaving the village and telling the wife that you could marry others is a repudiation of the marriage. And you are, in some sense, in modern terms, either separating or divorcing. And if you have divorced, you don't come back and claim. And she is not really immoral, because you actually uh, uh, took your husband's word 
as a fact and related to a particular person, and he has no right over that. And in fact, uh, there is an extremely uh, enlightening statement about uh, uh, what uh, chastity and sexuality in the villages can mean, uh, and uh, which uh, is modernist even in our standards today, uh, especially if uh, the right wing was to see such an argument. Uh, uh, so this is um, Chandis. This the chief court says on this subject of morality. Uh, on this subject, morality must be taken as equivalent to custom. Some communities, religion or tribal, regard marriage as a sacrament. For other, which uh, um, for uh, which religious ceremonies are necessary. Others require no religious ceremonies but insist on uh, certain legal formalities. And others require no formalities at all, but merely a clear expression of the intention of the parties to live together, that is, live in relationship. Uh, while some allow plurality of wives, some others only one wife. Some allow no divorce at all, others uh, allow uh, only under special circumstances. Others allow it at least uh, to the husband without restriction, that is, the wife could not divorce. So the court dismiss Kar uh, dismisses Karak Singh's appeal and upholds Chandi's rights over Isha Singh's property. But this is by the 70s and 80s. By the 90s, and the, the, the patriarchal voice asserts itself in a way that the, there is a displacement of the rights of women, and the patriarchal structure consolidates. The village brothers should come up a displacement of the rights of women, as well as other. The consolidation of the village brotherhood means it is the you know, propertied element who are. Those who are not property, those who have no land, are not part of the brotherhood. And that's an important, it is not about living in the village. It is about whether you have property or not. And the non property those who lived in the village are not part of the brotherhood. They have no rights in the land. They can only be tenants of the land. Therefore, there is a displacement which takes place over time, which uh, leads to a particular form of rural order and a brotherhood, which is consolidated through um, uh, panchayats and various other powers, and uh, is um, um, and the basis of rural order in uh, many ways even now. Just to conclude, I make two or three points about tradition and custom. Um, just two minutes more. 